Today, I will be presenting a way of thinking about the future uh, that is somewhat unconventional, but it has helped me a lot. Uh, it has helped our organization and the organizations that we work with a lot in understanding where are we now, where are we heading, and most importantly, why does everything seem to be so confusing during the last two or three years? First, to give you a bit of context, Demos Helsinki, I'm uh, the other co-founder. Last year, we did around 130 projects, uh, operate in 30 countries. We are actually 60 plus people already. We value-based uh, an NGO uh, so, a not-for-profit as well. Let's look at last few years. We've seen tremendous technological and economic development. Here on the top, we can see a self-driving bus that has been operating here in Dipoli. So, not a self-driving car. We are in the Nordics. It's a self-driving bus. Uh, and then, on, next to it, on the top, we have the World Championship uh, Master of several years in a game called Go. That is the most complex known game for a man. And a computer, a machine, did beat uh, that person on several occasions. What was really exciting about that was that we don't know how it won the game, right? It did something remarkable. It did something that has never been done in Go before. It discovered a new strategy. Uh, but how it did that, no one knows. So machines have evolved to a stage where they can learn to such extent that we don't understand how they learned to do what they learned to do. Then we have seen internet breaking on the streets, people chasing characters, and yet at the same time, authoritarian, populist, even fascist power is on the surge everywhere in the world. So it's a good, good time to, maybe for all of us, to lean back a bit and ask a question, where is it that we are heading? It's quite uh, clear that we live in extremely strange times because at the same time, it is possible to say that poverty is halved. You know, capitalism is working wonderfully. Everyone's incredibly rich, richer than ever. We have robot cars replacing drivers. We have solar power that is competing uh, with coal in price. We have AI beating human in many non-routine tasks, any tasks basically given to them, they do. We have, in the most of the world, girls going to school as much as boys do. We have two billion, over two billion people carrying a network computer on their pocket, something that would have been considered a supercomputer only 10 years ago. And yet, at the same time, geopolitical turbulence is back, authoritarian political power is on the rise, wealth concentration is at a historical height. Less than half of the rich countries' populations work permanently. This is much to do uh, with the increasing amount of pensioners, but of course, changing nature of work as well. The biggest companies in the world are on digital or fossil industries. With the uh, nuance that the biggest companies by revenue are on fossil fuel industries and the biggest companies by valuation are on digital industries. They are in fact the bigger, com bigger companies that we have ever seen uh, in the history of cooperative form. And what worries me most is that Western populations have pessimistic anticipations 
of the future. Not to forget that young generations, first time in the history, have more psychological illness uh, than previous generations. And our very, this very systems, our livelihoods depend on ecosystems uh, and climate is on a steady trajectory towards collapse. On some local levels, these collapses are already happening. So I'm not going to go into collapsonomics, but it's a serious thing. So on the one hand, we have astonishing progress. We have people who feel that they are lost and left behind. And perhaps the strongest voices uh, in at least politics are extremely divided into people who want to go back to the old industrial world where there were big factories, where people would congregate work throughout their lives. And then a techno-optimist world where companies usually from Silicon Valley solve all kinds of problems and life will be smooth for those who can afford it. So coming from today, there's a big promise, but also incredible, uh, almost dystopian futures. So no wonder why a lot of us are feeling pessimistic. This is a survey that Pew Research Center drives annually, and it's been looking like this for the last five years. The question is that do you think your kids are going to be financially better, or better off than you are? Less than one third of us think so. And, and if you think about the history, the economy has grown since 1780. So this has been true, but now people don't seem to think that it is true. So my, my hypothesis and, and the thought I'm going to try and explain to you and invite you to co think is that the dominating narrative of the next decades is set within a few years. And that, of course, implies that there is no dominating narrative. We don't have a story that tells us why we should be working together. An Italian philosopher wrote once in a Mussolini prison about a very similar uh, circumstance. He called it interregnum. So Antonio Gramsci said, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born yet. In this interregnum, a great variety of symptoms appear. And the quote goes on, and monsters arise. So my way of thinking is that we are now in a pause between two eras, and this is why it all seems so confusing. This is why something that was bioeconomy is now circular economy, and God knows what it is next. It is about search for a narrative for why we should be working together. So how did we get here? We had 30 years of bombardment of global megatrends. A lot of future students, such as me, we compete in what's the shortest possible list through which you can tell the narrative about the future. Uh, the future. Our list has five items. Firstly, and I will just go through this briefly and give you the slides so you can look at the data behind them. Most of us do know these, but there are some new elements appearing. This. Technological development refers to mostly digitalization and digital technologies. We would have network computing, AI, and these types of things. What we're seeing now is that they're destroying, new, they're destroying jobs quicker than replacing. And most importantly, they are replacing them with new kinds of jobs in other regions, in a lot more uh, concentrated areas. We're talking about square, me square miles in which the new jobs are being created. And as the productivity of work increases, uh, as the new jobs are in, in uh, companies and areas, 
way, uh, that are limited, we see uh, opportunities for everyone to participate on the one hand being increased because everyone go, can go on a platform and tell what they think. So anyone can go to Facebook and say, say some of these things. Yet it is Facebook uh, with its very few owners that will reap the most of the benefits of those. So even though digitalization is something that increases productivity throughout industries, the biggest benefits of those are in hands of few, let's say 100, mostly Chinese and US-based companies. Which leads us to global economy. And this is something you know super well. So I'll just skip through this quite quickly. But it means essentially that the economy is interdependent. The global value chains are stable. However, they create havoc by going from one place to another in terms of production and consumption. And production goes where consumption is. Uh, that seems to be the number one rule uh, here. It also means that wealth accumulates in few hands. Uh, but uh, the most kind of important meta uh, impact of the globalization of economy is that it doesn't matter what you can do or what you can produce. It only matters what you can do next. So what you can, wh what's your innovation or learning capacity? So in that sense, we're talking a lot about agility and even hyper-competition these days. Then uh, the, should I say, most deadly of them all, megatrends, uh, climate change and resource scarcity that links to it. So we have decreasing amount of global re resources and growing global consumption, which leads into new kinds of industries such as circular economy and clean tech, which have been very slow to take off. But uh, I think what we are now seeing as the most important part of this is, is the social and political unrest that comes from uh, uh, climate policies that are not seen being just or quick enough. So this is the youth on the streets, this is the yellow wests on the streets of Paris. And this is a conversation that is just picking up now. So what's happening then to human beings? Human beings, and in our time, are quite schizophrenic in that sense that we're very individualistic. We like to think about how we express ourselves, but we like to do that in a peer group and through a peer group. So at the same time, our sense of self is stronger and stronger, but it is within a group. And of course, technologies such as social media have just sped up this type of uh, development with its bubbles uh, and with its, uh, with its cap capacity to uh, create groups. There are some significant demographic changes. I could name uh, here perhaps three. Uh, the most important is the aging population, and sometimes we think that that's just Finland and it's a couple of years, or, or, or the, it's like a European thing. It's a global thing. China will probably or likely get old before it gets rich. Uh, the only place where we really have young people for the next decades, so this is a, uh, this is a very, very long period of old people ruling the world. But the only place where we have young people is Africa. So if you're looking for dynamism, new ideas, I would suggest that you would look for Africa. Uh, then where do, we, where do we, the advanced economists, then get new people? It's through immigration. So cities uh, in the advanced economies grow mainly by immigration. Uh, and this can lead into uh, serious polarization in some areas because you, and at the one hand, have extremely kind of competitive people who have been there for most of their lives and learned 
uh, their cosmopolitan ways, and then you have fluxes of people coming in. So now you may ask, why is this guy going on about these things? I know them already. Well, that's my point precisely. So what I would suggest now is to have a look at the combined and cumulative effects of these. And as suggested previously, it is that the old industrial world is dying, but the new one cannot be born yet. It is as if we are on a pause between two eras. So change making is essentially giving birth to a new era rather than changing uh, the old industrial institutions incrementally. So we are in a pause, there's a new era to be born, and change making is the creation of that era. But then we started thinking, okay, have we been here before? There's a few moments in history where it seems that we have indeed been here before. One of them has been retrospectively named as the Engels pause. Engels was the guy from Marx and Engels, I'm sure you heard of the guys, who was really interested in what was actually going on in the factories. There was a heated debate whether industrialization was really growing the economy, was it of any use, and so forth. And Engels made a fantastic study at that time where he noticed that in the large industrial cities such as Manchester and Liverpool, people's livelihoods were crushed. They were much better off uh, in the pre-industrial labor or in the agricultural work. So actually industrialization made for a very long time people's lives worse. So Engels pause, to be precise, is something that is said to uh, start, have started 1790 and lasted until 1840. The economy was growing, but people were not better off. And let's take a moment to think now, what does economy growing uh, in 1790 mean? It means explosive, exponential, fundamental growth. It means growth that had not been before. Before that, we didn't have economic growth. There may have been kings or feudal, feudal lords who didn't spend all their money suddenly on wars. But economic growth, the idea that economy could grow and it could be of benefit to all of us and it could be an ongoing thing was born there. If you look at the, what the artists say about the era, this is a famous painting uh, called the Gin Lane. It depicts uh, London uh, during the industrialization. Gin was uh, in, in, in London, Liverpool, and Manchester sold in pint glasses, so about like two times this. Has any one of you drank a pint of gin? No hands, right? But you can imagine what kind of a working life this was for the people. For the, re for the relaxation, you didn't think that yeah, maybe I'll go to the gym, I'll have a glass of wine, I'll watch something from the Netflix. No, you went to a gin house, you bought a bind of gin, you sat down, you drank it, you went to work next day. It has been said that the crucial technology of industrial revolution was gin, not the steam engine, because that helped people get along. Then, let's go back to today. What we're seeing today is a very similar uh, development in terms of productivity, GBD, and falling median wages. This is from Anglo-Saxon. Uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, world, however, the same has started happening later on uh, in the Nordics and European Union. In fact, Sweden uh, has become, in the 2000s, the country with the quickest uh, demising middle class. So I'm quite confident to say that the new Engels pause is here. So let's make sure that I'm not just making this whole thing up. We have median wages and living standards that have become stagnant by, and some, by some measures worsened. Check. We have in income equality that has climbed. 
check. We have remarkable new technologies that suggest effects on the economy will be profound, but we're not quite sure. We don't even know how to measure them. And people have negative anticipations of the future. Check. So what if we are actually now in 1809? The real question then is that what if the Engels pause takes another 50 years? Because a lot of people I speak about these things to, they say two things. One is that human is a creative thing. We will come up with something. Even though industrial work uh, would be replaced by robots, even though manufacturing would decrease in value, even though all of these things, we will come up with something. We have always come up with something. Yes, sure. But last time it took 50 years. So in order for us to not lose a generation, which is roughly 50 years, we need to understand that the change is not about the young or about the future. It is about us and it is now. What has helped me in understanding how the change kind of unveils and to make some sense of where we are and where we are heading is the thinking uh, of three stages of the transformation into, let's call it then, the post-industrial era. Firstly, we have the industrial era that continued, to my understanding, to year 2000, when we had the dot-com boom and bust and mobile phones came and so forth. Some people say it's 2008 when the financial crash was, never mind. We are now in an interregnum, we are in a pause that I'm hoping will end in 10 years' time. And then we'll go to a new era. That's the time that cannot be born yet. Something that we should be nurturing to be born as, a ch as change makers. So let's go through briefly what these eras have eaten. The industrial era. The industrial era was all about economies of scale. Bigger, the better, and therefore more efficient. It was about competing in that efficiency, and the most important principle was to take human experience out of knowledge. We had no data. We would have to every time go and measure things. There was no idea of data just gathering somewhere. Politics was divided into left and right. And the, more, and the most important thing for workers was to get paid better than they were. Growth, economic growth was hand in hand with emissions and most organizations were in climate denial. Said, don't know about that thing, climate. Markets, mar <clears throat> markets were the thing. Uh, markets, thanks. <laughs> so markets was the primary way of uh, allocating resources. Then we go into interregnum, the world we are inhabiting now. We talk about economics of agility, so what you can innovate, learn, do next. It's all about valuations, not about revenue. We're looking at productivity that seems to be on everyone's lips. We're entering a stage of not just competition, but of hybrid competition. You're not just in competition with people of the same profession, but everyone in the world, not just, people, not just companies in your sector, but kind of everyone of the limited knowledge and the material resources. We are seeing that now it's become okay to say that I feel this way. I don't know, but I feel this way. Uh, so emotion seems to be trumping knowledge, especially in politics. Data is seen as oil, as something that you extract, refine, use, uh, sell uh, to power the world. Politics is uh, gone 
not just here in Nordics, but everywhere in the world, emotion-driven small parties. It's very difficult to form coalitions because there is no grand narrative of left versus right. Suddenly, more pay is not interesting. It's about more work. So what the politicians are working on is creating more jobs. What we're innovating towards now seems to be innovations to 1.5 degree life. So life that is just in the means of a livable planet. Instead of climate uh, denialism, a lot of organizations that used to be denialist are now in a delay mode. So that means that we have these assets, we still want to use them, we know that they do produce a lot of emissions, but we have these assets. But mind you, the impact is exactly the same, whether you delay or deny uh, in terms of climate. It's a catastrophe. So it's a strategic move that isn't very strategic in that sense. Instead of markets, what seems to be now the prime allocation of resources, especially in terms of data, is platforms. So, let's go now to the next era, which I'm hoping will start by 2030, as opposed to in 50 years' time. We could enter, and now this is me freestyling, this is not empirical, but there's no data here because this is about the future so this is uh, my guesses are as good as yours but we could be entering an era of economics economies of utility and what that means that is because we have so much data we would actually know if the, the person or the organization we're selling to finds the stuff we're selling to them useful if they actually get utility out of it well that would lead into effectiveness uh, of operations being the form. Maybe we could even collaborate around that to get there. We would need to find a new role for knowledge uh, in the society and understanding in the society that goes beyond uh, emotions or data. And I'm suggesting that we would start thinking knowledge as something holy. This would mean that we would need to see data as infrastructure, something similar to, let's say, roads or tra railroads or uh, electricity, something that everyone needs to be able to do their stuff properly. From going to emotion-driven small politics, I would suggest that we would start, start thinking that maybe everything I do is political, Maybe there's a democracy in every activity of my life. Instead of free more pay or more work, I would suggest that most of us would like to have more say what they actually do with their time. That used to be called free time. It's not the same as lesser. And then, of course, our goal for innovation would be freedom without emissions. Then we would probably see some climate laggards, some countries, uh, some uh, industry sectors, some companies who just go like, we have these assets and we're going to burn the motherfucker down. We're not going to give it away. And we're just going to have to learn with the it, I guess. And if I would have a choice, we would no longer have one central form of resource allocation. Rather, we would have markets where they are good, we would have platforms where they are good, but we would also have free collaboration between people where that is good. So, I'm about to finish now with one thought, which is that you may consider yourself lucky. Uh, you're going to see all of this. Uh, especially if we decide that we want to go through this in 10 years instead of uh, 50 years. Thanks.